Good morning. Welcome to Lakeshore Assembly of God. We're so grateful that you've come to worship with us this morning. I just want to start. <laughs> well, we're, we're at 10 a.m. They're, they're going to be on their way here. But I wanted to let you know, next Saturday at 4 p.m., we're going to be having a couple's barbecue night out. So this is next Saturday. There's flyers on the table as you're on your way out through the double doors here. So <laughs> couple's barbecue night next Saturday, June 17th at 4 p.m. And it is going to be at Tony and Stacy's house. So Tony and Stacy can tell you more about that uh, if you have any questions. All right, this morning we're going to open in an attitude of prayer. And I just, I really believe that today is somebody's day. I believe it sincerely. I, I, I know that when we get dry, and my sister prayed this this morning, it, when we get dry, we don't realize it's because we're in the valley. But that's where the water is. The water is in the depths of the valley. And we fill up on the water before we climb the mountain of the Lord before we ascend to the duties he's called us to. And when we take that seriously, what we begin to recognize is we need him to get to the next place he has us going. So if you're in a place today where you know you're not supposed to be, maybe it's because you haven't drank in deeply from the Lord. Father God, I thank you, Lord, for your name, your word, your works, and your power. Holy Spirit, invade our hearts. Holy Spirit, seal this sanctuary. Holy Spirit, come and breathe fire into our lives. Bring us a new hope and a new song. Give us a new attitude of prayer. Let us raise our hands and surrender to you. Let us worship you with fire and truth, and let us worship you with purity and heart. Rip the pride from our minds and lives. Let us not think or consider what those around us may think of us as we lift up our hands to worship you. Let us just come as little children. Come with the innocence and the purity of knowing that you are God and we are your children. Father, anoint this time and bless each person here in Jesus' name. Amen. Those who can stand, would you please stand this morning for worship? Once again, 
return to you again. Oh God, we cry out for your mercy. Oh God, we cry out for your grace. Oh God, we cry out, set us free. Again. Again. Oh God, we cry out for your mercy. Oh God, we cry out for your grace. Oh God, we cry out, set us free. Oh God, we cry out once again. Once again. Once again, once again, once again. You know, in the old days, the priests had to wash and cleanse themselves from their sin before they went into the Holy of Holies, or they might die. Thankfully, we don't have that situation. Thankfully, the Lord will let us come in just as we are. But we do have a responsibility to rid ourselves of the sins that entangle us. That is our responsibility. And if you need help with it, the Lord is willing and ready to help with that. But you have to be willing to have a little willpower. So this morning, the Lord is going to do something in everyone's life. I don't want to leave here the way I came in. I want to go out of here changed. And if you're in that same boat... We just have to let the, the Lord do heart surgery on us. Because <laughs> most things that are wrong with us have to start with the heart. And then it moves along from there. So, Lord, this morning, make us fearless in the pursuit of you. Make us go after you like, like we go after things that we absolutely must have. Because we need you more than we've ever needed you before. So this morning, make us fearless. Lord, take us out of the darkness and into the light. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> Praise the Lord! <laughs> He's worthy. Amen. Waking up from the longest night, fix my eyes on a new horizon. 
Thank you. Praise the Lord. Wow. <laughs> Give <a> drink, Lord. <laughs> oh, praise praise God. Lord. Hallelujah. Praise you. How do we become fearless? When we're children, as little children, we receive the Lord with open arms and open hearts. We recognize the anointing that God places upon us is for us. But the enemy comes to kill, steal, and destroy and take that anointing away. And he wants you to believe that you're not good enough, but the blood of Jesus Christ covers all of it. Amen. Jesus bled in seven places so that you can approach his throne through the imputation of his righteousness onto your account. He bled from his feet and his hands for all the places you never should have gone and all the things you never should have touched or done. He bled from his head, covering his ears and his eyes and his mouth for all the things you never should have heard or seen, all the words you never should have said. He bled from his back as he was whipped, 40 times scourged an innocent man for all the times you turned your back on him. And he bled from his side, from a spear, for all the inner turmoil that you hold to let it out. At this time, we're going to return your anointing. If you have had your anointing stolen from you, we want to ask God to return it. And we're going to symbolically represent that by touching you on the forehead with oil in Jesus' name. Now, the oil itself is not a power. Christ alone is the power. 
But the oil symbolizes a return of that which the enemy stole from you and is not allowed to take again. I'm tearing up the legal rights right now in Jesus' name. Come forward to receive the symbolism of the return of the plans and the future Christ has for you. All that's within me feels dry This is my prayer and my hunger and need My God is a God who provides This is my prayer in the fire In weakness and trial and pain There is a faith through for more worth than gold So refine me, Lord, through the flame Triumph is still on its way. I am a conqueror and co heir with Christ, so firm on his promise I stand. I will bring praise, I will bring praise. No weapon formed against me shall remain. I will rejoice, I will declare. God is my
bring it all to peace. The storm surrounding me, let it break at your name. Still, call the steed to still, the raging me to still every way. At your name, Jesus, Jesus, you make the darkness tremble. Jesus, Jesus. You silence fear, Jesus, Jesus. You make the darkness tremble, Jesus, Jesus. Peace, bring it all to peace. The storm surrounding me, let it break. At your name, still, call the sea to still. Raging me to still every way at your name, Jesus, Jesus. You make the darkness tremble, Jesus, Jesus. You silence fear, Jesus, Jesus. You make the darkness tremble, Jesus, Jesus. Breathe, breathe, call these bones to live. Call these lungs to say once again, I will praise, breathe, call these bones to live, call these lungs to say once again, I will praise Jesus, Jesus, you make the darkness tremble, Jesus, Jesus, you silence fear, Jesus, Jesus, you make darkness tremble Jesus Jesus your name your name is a light that the shadows can't deny your name cannot be overcome your name is a light forever lifted high your name cannot be overcome Shadows can't deny your name cannot be overcome. Your name is alive, forever left and high. Your name cannot be overcome. Jesus, Jesus, you make the darkness tremble. Jesus, Jesus, you silence fear. Jesus, Jesus. Silence fear, Jesus, Jesus. You make the darkness tremble, Jesus, Jesus.
So do you have confidence in the Lord this morning? Is that where your security lies? If it's in something else, then you're an error. <laughs> I'm not wrong. I am not wrong. If your security is in your job, you are an error. Jobs come and go. Lives come and go. People come and go in our lives. We can't have our security even in another person. It has to be in God. So this morning, yes, this morning, if your security is in someone or something, uh -huh, then you need to lay it down. Because you know what? God loves you so much, he might just take it from you. Whoa. Whoa. Lord, this morning, if there's anything that we have confidence in that's not you, Lord, we just lay it down at your feet. That's right. Mm. Things are given to us for a temporary period of time. People are in our lives for a temporary period of time. Lord, it all goes back to you. That's right. So, Lord, right now, if we need to lay it down, then let's lay it down. In Jesus' name, let there be no hindrance in our lives. Because this is the confidence we have in Christ Jesus. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. confidence because I've seen the faithfulness of God still inside the storm 
the promise of the shores. I trust the power of your words. Enough to seek your kingdom first. Beyond the barren place, beyond the ocean waves. When I walk through the water, I won't be overcome. When I go through the river, I will not be drowned. My God will make a way, so I am not afraid. Yes, Lord, you keep the promises made. There isn't one that is delayed, so I will not lose heart. Here I lift my arms and start to sing into the night. My praise will call the sun to rise, declare the battle's won, declare that it is done. Praise God. Before we go to prayer, um, there's a big event coming up in August. I'm going to have Janelle uh, Unger come and share with the congregation. It's called Hope Delivered. We're renting the Lake County Fairgrounds. And uh, a lot is happening in that. It's, but there's a lot of uh, really difficult things that are happening in the, in the midst of that. I'm not going to get into it. But uh, we need to, when we go to prayer, let's pray. Because Hope Delivered hopes to minister to thousands of people in Lake County. Everything from people dealing with drug, alcohol addictions, to homelessness. Whatever the case may be, they're, they're, it's, it's going to be unbelievable. Um, it's going to be similar to the event that we had many years ago at the fairgrounds um, when we had Convoy of Hope. This is going to be really very similar to that and uh, very centered on helping people come to the saving knowledge of Christ as well as ministering to their needs. And uh, also, um, John Lonsack, a friend of our motorsports ministry, went to be with the Lord uh, uh, the other day. And uh, let's keep his family uh, in prayer as well. Let's go to the Lord. Father, we ask for this uh, event coming up. Lord, this is a huge event, and there's some huge things coming against it. And that's how it is. We live in a time and a place where if you simply say what's true, you can get in trouble. <laughs> I mean, we live in a, in a time, I, I thought I'd be dead and buried long before I would see the headlines and the things that are happening in our society. 
So God, we realize that in these last days, we need the anchor. We need the rock of truth, and that is you. So Lord Jesus, have your way in our lives. Have your way in Lake County. Father, we pray for not only this event, but for all those that are around us, God, dealing with unbelievable needs in their lives, Lord. And Father, it is by the grace of God, go I, and it is by the grace of God that I am, I am not perhaps one that is going to need some of that specific ministry because, God, you have already ministered to me. But I testify of your goodness and your grace. And, Father, we thank you and we praise you that you are pouring out your spirit on Lake County. And, God, we look forward to see the good things that are going to take place. The obstacles are certainly there. But God, with you, we are more than a majority. Hallelujah. With God, Father, we have the victory in Jesus Christ. For you are more than conquerors through Christ and, and who dwells in us. And we thank you for your presence. We thank you for your power. We thank you for every need, even in this congregation today. Father, you know the secret things in our own lives and hearts. You know the secret places that often people suffer in, in some unique way. And, and I know that when we go through things, we feel like we're the only person in the world hurting. Man, I wish that was true. I'm telling you as a pastor, every single one of us has a very unique cross. And there's a very unique weight. But Lord, you already died on the main cross. Hallelujah. And it was there, Lord, that you died so that we could have forgiveness and we could have the power of the Holy Spirit to live in this world. You promised us in this world you'll have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Hallelujah. So God, we give you the praise. We give you the glory for this morning. In Jesus' precious name, amen and amen. Give him a praise. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. Got several announcements here. Praise God. Hallelujah. Yeah, Sharon, come on up. She's going to share in a minute. Uh, this Tuesday, we are uh, going to have a car show, Rain or Shine, for the North Coast Mustang and All Ford Club. At the end of the month, the last Wednesday, we'll be having the All Brands. We're going back to our uh, Car Crunch car shows with over 20 trophies and uh, it's going to be wild, but the one this Tuesday, it looks like uh, that we're going to have, looks like the weather is not, might not work in our favor, but we're going to do it rain or shine. Many of you already signed up to come to that. I might call some of you and tell you don't come to help if I don't need that much help, because some of you, you're going way out of your way to come, and uh, right now, uh, if, 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 if I don't call you, come. But I might call and say, hey, just wait for the next car show when we really need a lot of help. Because if it rains and, it, and it's 50-something degrees that they're predicting, um, that we're going to have less than half of the crowd that we have. And I don't need dozens of, of helpers for that. If it's like it was the last car show, I need, a, I need all deck on hand. So I'll be in touch with you on that. Uh, also, Tuesday night, 645, if you come to the car show and you help out there and, and they have a donation dinner. It's donation dinner, by the way. Um, uh, 645 right here in the sanctuary, they're going to be having a prayer meeting. So those of you that come early for the car show, you'll be able to just uh, eat out there, have some fellowship, and then come on in for that. Also, next Sunday morning, we're going to be having a water baptism. Praise the Lord. Anyone who needs to be baptized in water, you've committed your life to Christ, you've recommitted your life to Christ, you've accepted Christ into your life uh, for the first time, and you've never gone into the waters to confess Christ, next Sunday morning at 9.15, right in the room in the back there where the big window is, I'll be having a pre-baptism class. We already have several that uh, I know about and several others that I've heard about. So whoever shows up for that, good. Also, the clothing ministry is coming up. And uh, Sharon, would you like to come? and share what you need to share. Yes. I'm going to pass out the sign-up. Okay. Um, first off, I want to thank everyone who has helped us in the past. Um, we really need workers for Friday during the day, and I know a lot of you work and can't do that, but some of you who don't work, if you could give us an hour or two, that would be great. 
The problem we have is people look through the clothes and they just discard them. So we have to go behind them and fold them back up so other people can actually see what we have. So that's why we need a few extra people to do that. Also, um, every year I go to Florida, and uh, this year was no exception. And I went, and whenever I go, Allison and Ernie hold down the fort for me. Well, this year I fell and, and shattered my elbow. So they have been here for me since then, since February. They are absolutely and positively the best workers I have ever seen. Okay. <laughs> if there was an award for, for somebody who, who helps out all the time in, in all of our ministries, they help with almost everything, they should get an award because they are absolutely and positively irreplaceable. Okay. Yes. Oh, what, what's this? Lisa prayed off these flyers. As for the help that we need setting up and unloading the totes onto the tables on June 19th, June 20th, and 21st, that's Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday of next week, we need help those three days. Big, yeah, yes. unloading the totes. Okay. I have one more thing. Hi, Hetty. It's been a long time since I saw you. It's so nice to see you in church. Welcome back. Um, one of the songs that we sang today really, really hit me. It's about faithfulness. Faithfulness is what we long for. Faithfulness is what we need. Faithfulness is what you want from me. And that says it all, as far as I'm concerned. Thank you, everybody, for your prayers for my recovery. It's going to be a long haul. I have probably another nine months of um, whatever to do whatever, I don't know, range of motion and all this other stuff that, you know, it's going to be a while. But I want to thank everybody for all your prayers and uh, all your help. Thank you. Amen. Thank you, Sharon. And uh, what, we, what we did different this year is we have 90, probably 85% of, or maybe more than that, of the clothing is already in the church. In years past, it was in the garage. We'd come on Father's Day at 5 o'clock, and we'd get everything out of the garage and bring it in. We already have probably 150 bins of clothing inside in two classrooms in the back here. Next Sunday, immediately after the service, I'm going to ask anyone that is physically able, let's get just a line of 15, 20, 25 members. The Teen Challenge guys are going to be here with us, and let's get We'll have the tables all set up in the hall. All we need is to get all the clothing in the bins from the back classroom into the fellowship hall. Nobody, uh, the TC guys and a few other people are going to go out, get the stuff out of the garage. The household items are going to be in the pavilion. So we don't, 80% of the work has been eliminated because uh, they've been bringing the stuff in, they've spent probably a better part of 40 to 50 hours getting all those bins inside the church. So how many can, after the service, those of you that are physically able can, can get in a line? We'll, we'll, we're, Sharon cannot pick stuff up, but she can point and shoot. She'll be in the fellowship hall. So when you bring the bin in, she'll immediately just tell you where to put it and uh, how many can stay after the service and help next week? How many can stay? How many, yeah, can do what you can. How many can stay? Raise your hand if you're able to help. Thank you, Jeff. Okay. Amen. Anyone else? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. That'll help. That'll help. All right. If we have 10, 15 plus some of the TC guys, it'll only take us, I think, 10, 15 minutes. Um, service ends at 1130. By 12, you're going to be in your car going home. Okay. So praise God. Well, today we, uh, as you know, my brother uh, Mike and Amber, they went on a sabbatical. Uh, for the last few months. So this is the first time in, what, four or five months that you've been able to preach? So let's give a warm welcome for Mike. Mike Major. All right, Mike. Give him heaven. All right. Praise God. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Jim. And uh, it is so good to be back. I can't even tell you. There's just no place like home. There, there really is no place like home. And 
the truth is, uh, Amber and I did receive what God wanted us to receive. We received uh, what we needed to learn. We learned what we needed to uh, see. We saw the positioning that God needed to move us to. He moved us to. And so it was well worth it. And um, I'll tell you this, too. This, this kind of makes me chuckle. Um, when, I, when I left for sabbatical, right before I left, we had one Sunday school teacher. And it was, we, we normally have three or four, uh, but I left, and when I returned, we had like double the number of people in Sunday school. So I thought, well, maybe my being gone is, is good. <laughs> so if you've never been to Sunday school at Lakeshore Assembly of God, let me just paint a picture for you. So what happens is, is you're going to come through these doors about 8.45, 9 a.m. You're going to be greeted by people who love the morning time more than you ever could on a Sunday. You're going to come straight down this hallway into the Godspeed Cafe, fill up on a premium roast cup of coffee for free. Hop up the stairs through the double French doors where you'll be greeted by a band of theologians with over a century's worth of knowledge. <laughs> Sometimes they let me participate too. <laughs> but truly, I can't believe how quickly the last 12 weeks flew by. We had 16 scheduled, but we came back in 12. And uh, while we were on sabbatical, we went to about a dozen churches. And uh, Amber went to a church as far as Texas. Praise God. And to be balanced, most of what we saw was edifying. And it was very edifying, but some of it really shocked us. And I'm going to share it with you. While we were resting and renewing in this time that God gave us, he asked us a very formal question. And it really made Amber and I think. The question made us think about things like our willingness to fight for the faith, which is a big one. Also, our willingness to fight for our most precious natural resource, our children. So we prayed about things like our faith and our future and our legacy. In a minute, I'm going to give you the same formal question that God gave us. And my goal is that it positions you as it has positioned us into an attitude of individual awareness for the future and an attitude of responsibility for now. There are things here now, like the banning of Christian story hours at local public libraries. There are things here now, like small pockets of secular culture referring to the month of June as Pride Month. And there are things yet to come. Now, it's not for me to say what's on the horizon. But from what I do see, I can say that the American church isn't ready. They're not ready for what's coming. And the good news is, after today, you are going to be ready. Praise God. Listen, no matter how the future shakes out, Jesus isn't going to be shaken by it. Nor should you be. Church... You need to be prepared, not scared. And that starts with one thing, faith. It takes faith to have confidence in God. It takes faith to do what's right, not what's easy. It takes faith to put on God's holy armor every day. It takes faith to stand strong against the enemy and fight the good fight. And listen, I'm not even preaching yet. I'm just getting warmed up. There was a Chinese missionary, after the COVID racket was all over, he flew in to the States from a megachurch pastor, paid the way. The megachurch pastor wanted to impress the Chinese missionary because the Chinese church was exploding, but so was his, so he thought. So as he showed this Chinese missionary all the churches on his campus, starting with the smallest church, going to the largest, and at the end, he showed him the bookstore, and he showed him the Starbucks knockoff coffee shop, and he showed him all the grandeur and glam, and the Chinese missionary didn't say a word. The pastor got kind of upset, kind of looked at him and said, well, don't you have anything to say? And the Chinese missionary says, I'm shocked. The pastor kind of leans against the wall, puffs up his chest. I would have said the same thing. Chinese missionary said, no, no, no. 
I'm shocked how much you accomplished without the presence of the Holy Spirit. The last 12 weeks, Amber and I felt like the Chinese missionaries. As if we were visiting another country, while many things were good, the things that were bad shocked us. Folks, the church is losing its DNA. Am I allowed to tell you that I am scared at what we saw? Am I allowed to tell you that the DNA of the church in the United States is changing? There are those among us, sort of almost Christians, who are changing. What I'm about to tell you are real things that Amber and I saw. We saw a pastor from the pulpit spend more time bragging about, passing out, and attempting to sell his self-published books than talking about the cost of eternal damnation. We saw a pastor stand in front of his entire congregation, senior pastor, and brag about sinning to his congregation while talking about how every church around his was dead, how blind. We saw less fellowship, less hunger, and less learning. We saw fewer participants and fewer workers. We saw more idealism and more consumerism, more ideologies, more qualifications. We saw churches obsessively concerned with people coming in, but doesn't care about people going out to change the culture. And yes, can I tell you that 2 Timothy 2, uh, 2 Timothy 4, 3 is absolutely here and now. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lust, they will heap upon themselves teachers with itching ears. In summary, we saw good, but we saw bad. And we saw the cupcake Christianity of America that's here today. We, we saw it, and it wasn't pretty. There are these types of Christians who craved a life equipped with a thick, heavy, layered cocoon of candy cane so-called battle-ready armor, a covering like a marshmallow or a gummy bear or something else without a spine. It's a false armor, completely sealing them and protecting them from the duties of a Christ-centered life rather than an army that allows them to divinely be empowered to participate in the world, they wanted an armor that protected them from it. We all know that comfort has a place. But too much of it can be a good thing. For example, when you go up to the window, take a look outside, and run back to the castle of the couch, and cry into your Chick-fil-A soup, waiting for the rapture to come, you're too comfortable. Either pastor hasn't given you a duty or a vision or in general you don't have a discipline to understand that the privilege of being a child of Christ comes with the responsibility to be in the world but not part of the world, Romans 12, 2. Hey, I'm still getting warmed up now. The only way to operate in the world and not fall prey to the world is by divine empowerment through the Holy Spirit. Friends, these are things you need to know because if you get too comfortable as a Christian, you won't have a lot of vigor and vinegar left to stay the course. So the formal question that God asked us is the same question I'm going to ask you right now. Are you going to fight or are you going to forfeit? Either way, it's going to take faith. Here's why you need to listen, because if you're going to fight, you need to know the three pillars of how to fight, what it's going to cost, and who you're up against. How to fight, what it's going to cost, who you're up against. And there's a lot on the line right now. Think about this. You're in the actual month. The secular culture has chosen to celebrate the most odious of all sins, pride. 
Pride is literally at the root of every sin. Sin is ugly. Sin makes people say and do ugly things. And friends, things are getting ugly. Pride doesn't come to reason. It comes to kill, steal, and destroy. And that's why pride is a Goliath you need to take head on. If you're going to fight, you need to know how. Let's see what the Bible has to say. Turn to Ephesians 6.12 in your Bible, or pull it up on your smartphone, or grab one from the pew in front of you. And as you're turning there, you're going to realize that my King James Version of the Bible is slightly differently worded than your Bible if you have a different version. And the reason for that is because although we have the same original documents, which is 5,800 Greek New Testament documents, over 10,000 Hebrew Old Testament documents, and 15,000 Coptic, Syriac, Syriac, Latin, and uh, Aramaic manuscripts, there are three equivalencies that are used to translate your Bibles. All right? So you have a formal equivalence, which focuses on translating it word for word, like the King James Bible. You have the functional equivalence, which is more of a thought for thought. That's sort of like the NIV. And then you have an optimal equivalence, and it's sort of a balance of the word for word and the thought for thought, where it helps the reader better understand. And the Holman Christian Standard Bible would be an option of that equal optimal equivalence approach. And the reason I mention that, when I was in college, uh, I took a class on Genesis, which is the foundation of everything that's going on today. And every theme, major theme in the Bible is traced back to Genesis. And so our teacher told us, or recommended, that we would go through all uh, of the book of Genesis, but through four different equivalencies. And at the time, I didn't take that very seriously because I had the version of the Bible that I used, and that was that. But as I got older, I started using all three of the equivalency variations. And now I use them interchangeably, and it's grown my faith tremendously. So if you've never done that, I'll leave it as a challenge for you. Uh, it'll grow your faith. All right, Ephesians 6.12. This is where you're going to find... That if you're going to fight, you're going to need to know how. And that begins right here in 12 with knowing who your enemy is. All right, so as we get into it. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against the wild, or I'm sorry, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Or if you have an NIV, it'll say in the heavenly realms. Okay, which we'll look at in a moment. So who are you fighting? You're not fighting flesh and blood. In other words, you're not fighting your coworkers, your kids, the guy who's going too slow on your commute Monday morning, the woman who stole your parking spot. Look, you're fighting not against flesh and blood. Ephesians 6.12 says you and I fight against the rulers of darkness, principalities, and powers. Whom rules the darkness? Satan. You and I are fighting against Satan, period. Satan is the one who roughs you up and tempts you every day with temptations. And whether you like it or not, you and I fight spiritual wickedness in the first and second heavenly realms. Okay, A heavenly realm is a term used in Scripture to refer to one or more of three distinct realms. Psalm 104.12, birds of the heaven, this is the first realm atmosphere of earth. In Isaiah 13, 10, we talk about the stars of heaven and their constellations. That's the second heaven. That would be outer space. And Revelation 11:19 19 describes the opening of God's temple in heaven. That's the third heaven or God's dwelling place. So there's three realms, the earth, the stars, and God's dwelling place. And our fight takes place in the first and second realms. This is to say our fight is here, in real time, right now, and if you're not a believer, you're going to have wicked and de demonic forces oppressing you in a way you can't really stop. See, the one who oppresses you and tempts you, and can, if you're not a believer, possess you, attempt to influence your behaviors and the behaviors of people around you. So you can see some pretty crazy things in the first and second realms. And that's why when people say to me, oh, I've seen an alien, I believe them. 
I do. The difference is what some people might believe to be intergalactic aliens, I believe to be transdimensional beings from a different dimension, i.e. the spiritual powers of uh, darkness. All right? So Satan dwells among us here on earth. And Satan is a threat to us. Satan was originally from God's dwelling place, the third realm. But since he has been removed, as Jesus told us in Luke 10, 18, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven, Satan is here. And because he isn't able to return to God's dwelling place in the third heaven, although we do see God communicate with Satan on God's terms, at least during the time of Job. Job recorded that in chapter 1, 6 through 7. He, God looks at Satan and he says, where have you come from? Satan answered, uh, God, and he said, from roaming through the earth and going back and forth in it. That's a reminder that peace and rest only come from God. Satan never can rest. He must roam. He's always roaming. Satan's fall from heaven is um, described in Isaiah 14, 12 through 14, and Ezekiel 28, 12 through 18. I'll leave that as homework for you if you're interested in learning about Satan's fall. But these two passages are extremely powerful because they are specifically referring to the kings of Babylon and Tyre. And they also reference the very demonic spiritual power behind those kings as being Satan himself. In the same way that Satan influenced or possessed those two kings, Satan and his minions continue to influence those around us and us through a demonic oppression and temptation. And if you're not a Christian, there can be demonic possession. Now, I say demonic possession cautiously because in this time of Hollywood, we see too many parts where a Catholic exorcist goes to some guy's house in the middle of a rainstorm at midnight on a dead-end street and crazy things happen. Now let me really explain. Nobody can tell you the nuance of a true demonic possession. And other than personal experience, nobody can tell you about demonic oppression. And perhaps that's because we're not supposed to know all the details of the demonic. We're supposed to know the facts. Now listen, there's three essential keys concerning the demonic. And what we know is these three, and here's why. Number one, we know that Jesus delivered demons out of people. And in fact, a third of his miracles are that. And Jesus told his disciples to cast demons out of people as well. So Jesus did it, the disciples did it, were disciples of Christ. For the purpose of releasing them from their infirmities. Now, we see Jesus instructing his disciples in the practice of deliverance. Matthew 10.1, Jesus summoned the 12 disciples, gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out um, and to heal every kind of disease and sickness. Jesus also said delivering people of demons is commonplace and normal if you're a believer. You see, in Mark 16.17, Jesus said, These signs will accompany those who have believed. In my name they will cast out demons. In my name they will speak new tongues. Jesus is the one who imputes the righteousness onto us, which is then the authority to cast out demons. That's Mark 3.15. So the first thing we know is Jesus is our chief cornerstone. In Ephesians 2.20, we, via Jesus' divine imputation, are allowed to deliver people from demonic strongholds. Amen? So the second key, the second key, is knowing what your weapons are to battle the demons. The weapons are not of flesh. That's why trying harder to stop doesn't work. Addiction is of Satan, and it is against the flesh. If you have an addiction, you have demonic company. If there is something you don't want to do, but you can't stop doing it, you have demonic company. That's why you can't be free to get good by yourself. That's why Satan will convince you that you can win without God's help all day, every day, forever. See, 1 Peter 5, 8 says, Be sober, for Satan prowls around like a lion looking for someone to devour. He doesn't want to blemish you. He doesn't want to trip you. He wants to utterly destroy you now and for generations to come. The Bible says, if you want to be free to get good, 
If you want to be free to do God's work in your life, in your family, in this country, you need to take on the divine power of the Holy Spirit. 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 5 says, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war with or, or war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God in the pulling down of strongholds and casting down imaginations of every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God, bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Every thought. Amen. Hallelujah. And the final key, and perhaps the most overlooked part of how we fight. How do we fight? What do we do? We don't know how. We know we need to. We know there's an enemy. We know he's real and here right now. In Ephesians 6, through 4, 6, 14 through 18, we learn how to fight. As you're turning there, which will be right down for most of you, I have to flip the page. Six fourteen through 18. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench the fiery darts of the wicked, and that the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and all supplication in the Spirit, watching thereunto with all pers perseverance and supplication for all the saints. Hallelujah. A, there's armor. B, there's prayer. A, there's armor. B, there's prayer. The armor is the spiritual application by the Holy Spirit for the divine protection of the wearer, you. The divine protection is applied piece by piece through prayer with the armor, and through spiritually empowered prayer, you have the duty and privilege of asking for divine power to destroy strongholds in every form they present themselves. In three words, destroying your Goliath. Getting free to destroy your Goliath and getting free to be good are the same thing. The crazy powerful practice is concealed in the Old Testament and then revealed in the New Testament. Let me take you to Samuel, 1 Samuel 17. I'm going to summarize it. This is the story of David's great courage in defeating Goliath. And this is one of the most well-known historical Bible facts of all time. What David did was he considered his source for courage and strength before he ever went into battle. Who was it? It wasn't the five smooth stones from the riverbank. It wasn't the armor Saul put on him. And it wasn't the sling. See, Dave, David wanted God all over him. And David knew he needed spiritual armor to defeat Goliath. David said in 1 Samuel 17, 37, the Lord has rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear. And the Lord will rescue me from the hand of this Philistine. It was King Saul, who was a non-believer, who placed more trust in the physical armor of man rather than the armor of God. See, it was Saul who put the armor on David. And David was so overcome with the size of it, he couldn't even move. So he took it right back off again because David knew the spiritual application of God's armor. That's what was needed to destroy Goliath. Whatever the Goliath is in your life, addiction, fear, doubt, anxiety, addiction, and I said addiction twice because nothing should be omnipresent in your life other than God. Your Goliath is the thing that wants to be omnipresent in your life. Your Goliath wants to be your every desire and your every fear. What is your Goliath? And do you want to break it off? See, folks get Stockholm Syndrome. They don't want their Goliath to go away. The very thing that is causing them pain they believe gives them their identity. 
gives them their life, gives them what they want, but it only comes to kill, steal, and destroy. It's going to require the spiritual application of the full armor of the Spirit to defeat your Goliath. Do you have a Goliath that needs defeating? See, King Saul's armor was man's armor. The gummy bear stuff. And man's armor makes a mockery of God's full armor of the Spirit. See, man's armor is the fallen image of God's armor. You have the bedazzled belt to hold up your lies and image on the status of Facebook and social media. You have the breastplate of pride to humbly hide your arrogance. You have the helmet of fantasy to escape reality and gorge yourself on falsehoods disguised as truth, false love, false friends, false hope. You have the shoes fitted with cowardice to follow or endorse tomorrow's fads today, no matter what it will cost you or someone else in the end. You have the shield of money to put out the flame of the Holy Spirit needed to trust, love, and cherish God, or the sword of compromise to keep peace by the capitulation of Scripture, the total surrender of it. All right, I need to wind this thing up here. I know some of you got Goliaths you're ready to break off right now. I know some of you are ready to break off lies others have said about you or you have said about yourself. I know some of you are ready to break off pride. Some of you need to take a break of the fantasy. Perhaps you need God to break off cowardice so you can share the gospel message with others. Perhaps you're one who needs to lay down the shield of money so you can finally trust fully in Christ. And maybe it's time for you to put down the sword of compromise. What is it for you? What does God need to break off? Is your Goliath a generational curse? Is your Goliath a thing you swore to yourself many years ago? I'll never let someone do that to me again. What is the Goliath in your life? You have a Goliath in your life if you have things that keep coming back when you repent of them. You have a Goliath in your life if things keep coming back after you rebuke them, after you um, put on the wrong armor. That's how you know you have a Goliath in your life. See, maybe one piece of the armor is from God. And the reason you can't be free to get good is because you can't compromise with Goliath. See, if you run with Goliath, you're going to need to choose what God gets and what the devil keeps. And the devil always plays for keeps. See, G.K. Chesterton, he had a way with words. He reminded us how the devil always plays for keeps. The devil is a gentleman and asks you down to stay at his little place. What's its name? It isn't far away. Oh, blind your eyes and break your heart and hack your hand away and lose your love and shave your head, but do not go to stay. At this little place in what's its name where folks are rich and clever, the golden and the goodly house where things grow worse forever. They are things you need to know of, though, things, though you live and die in vain. There are souls more sick of pleasure than you are sick of pain. There is a game of April Fool that's played behind its door where the fool remains forever and the April comes no more. And that is the blue devil that once was the blue bird, for the devil is a gentleman and doesn't keep his word. Hmm. I'm trying to close. You have no idea how hard I'm trying to close, but i got to get these last two little points in before I do. See, the Bible says if you're going to fight, you need to put on the full armor of the Spirit. You can't stand against the wiles of the devil without it. You and I are sure casualties without the armor. So you and I... How do we put the full armor of the Spirit on? You pray it on. Prayer is how we fight our battles. Prayer is fighting. Prayer is to be a continuous rejoicing, a continuous communication with God throughout the day, throughout life. Prayer is how we fight our battles. Prayer is how we overcome temptation. Prayer is the fighting that dismantles the Goliath in your life. Prayer makes you whole and connected and complete. Prayer is fighting. And it is how you fight. Praise God. See, maybe some of you are like I was. 
Maybe some of you are like me. I used to have a hard time with prayer. I used to have a hard time praying, and especially in public, it could be very hard. And then I read 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, and now I can pray without ceasing. See, 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18 is how you pray. Rejoice evermore. Pray without ceasing. In everything, give thanks to God, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Prayer is rejoicing without ceasing, giving thanks in all circumstances, and knowing that by participating in prayer, you're in God's will. That's a good place to be. Now, I don't do this for everybody, but I'm going to do it for you. All throughout the pews, I placed a prayer for you to take home. Now, if you don't have one, I'll get you one. But you can use this as an oversized Bible bookmark and a reminder to pray on the full armor of the Spirit every day for you and your family. This is it, friends. I have one last formal question for you. Are you going to fight or are you going to forfeit? It's up to you to apply the full armor of the Spirit every day. So are you going to fight or are you going to forfeit? It's a choice. It's one or two. It's binary. So you've always had binary, and it'll always be binary. The only reason some small and, and noisy parts of culture are trying to get people, especially young people, and specifically young girls, to believe that there are options beside binary is because anything God makes, the devil tries to imitate, steal, and pollute. God made us in his image and likeness. Demons want to remake you into their image and their likeness through temptation, confusion, and delusion. Life and how we understand life is binary. DNA is a double helix. It contains two chromosomes. Everything at bottom is binary. For example, even if you divide people into non-binary and binary, it's two. It's always two choices. It's always. There's right, there's wrong. There's better, there's worse. There's truth, there's lies. There's peace, there's calamity, there's good, there's evil, there's order, there's chaos. There's life, there's death. There's heaven, there's hell. There's the fire of revival and the fire of judgment. There's fighting and there's forfeiting. Are you going to fight or are you going to forfeit? There is a time coming and now has arrived where we need to fight. If you choose to forfeit, it's going to cost you. You will be steamrolled. You will be flattened, tossed around like a wet rag and hung out to dry. And it'll cost you, oh boy, will it cost you, my friend. It'll cost you your confidence. It'll water down your faith. It can even cost you your family to the third and fourth generation, the Bible says. But if you choose to fight, yes, you will also face the hellfire of yesterday's demons today. But as you're getting popped in the mouth by Goliath, who doesn't want you to come in his territory, you don't back down, and you're going to cancel him. All right? Amen? See, Christ tells people the truth out of love for others of the Imago Dei. I don't say this to you because I dislike you. I say it because I love you. If I would allow you to recognize confusion as normal, then I wouldn't care much for you. See, in this age of demons, God is prepared to empower and energize you to live for Christ. To fight the good fight, to run the good race with confidence and boldness in your heart. Faith in your life, truth in your legacy. And the Bible says God will bless that legacy to the thousandth generation to come. You have two choices. You must choose one. Are you going to fight? Or are you going to forfeit? 1990, Buster Douglas was a no-name boxer in an off-brand ring. He, he was number three contender in this small little no-name league. And somehow, Buster Douglas landed a fight with Mike Tyson's. By all counts, it was 100 to 1, nobody long shot to beat the heavyweight champ of the world. 
Buster's mother, though, was so proud of him that he landed the bout with Mike Tyson. She told everyone she knew and everyone she didn't that Buster was going to win. Buster wasn't so sure, though. But his mom kept saying, on February 11th, 1990, my son is going to beat Mike Tyson. 30 days before the fight in January 1990, Buster Douglas's mother died. At that moment, Buster had two choices. Am I going to fight or am I going to forfeit? Buster chose to fight. Buster got in the ring with indestructible Mike Tyson and he chose to fight. On the cards, Buster was winning, but at the end of the eighth round, Tyson landed a bomb that should have ended it all. Buster slapped the mat in disgust as he stood back up. The bell rang and Buster made it safely back to his corner, saved by the bell. Ding, 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 ding. Buster came out more frustrated, beaten, hurt. He wasn't going to give up. With tenacity, grit, determination, and faith, Buster Douglas kept fighting and kept fighting. And in the 10th round, Buster Douglas did the impossible. He landed the blow that knocked Goliath out, absolutely shocking everyone. A 10th round knockout of indestructible Mike Tyson. Buster didn't have perfect circumstances, but he went out to fight. Except for one person, nobody believed in him. But he went out to fight. Buster was doing everything right on paper, but he still got knocked to the mat. Some of you are asking God for perfect circumstances. God is asking you to fight where you are at. Some of you got nobody giving you a chance, but God says you're more than a conqueror in Christ. Some of you are doing everything right on paper, but you're still getting knocked to the mat. You got to do what my friend Buster did. You need to start fighting. You need to get real. I have a deep anguish and pain, inner turmoil, when I see believers forfeit and surrender to the enemy because they don't know who they are in Christ. Where are the teachers? Where are those going out to bring people to Christ in the 11th hour, the first four words somebody is going to say when they get to hell is, I don't belong here. And they're right, because hell was made for Satan and his minions. But it's their choice, and they're going to beg God for one more choice. One more chance to get it right. To give God the chance to be a believer in him. So do you believe? See, Jesus poured out his spirit in Joel. He didn't say, if you complete these five steps. He didn't say, I may. He said, I will, in the final days, pour out my Holy Spirit, and you will be clothed from on high with power to go and spread the gospel to all the ends of the world. You are the head, not the tail. You are above, not beneath. You are a victor in Christ. You are a winner through Jesus. You are not going to forfeit. Here's what we're going to do. If you're ready to have the authority of Jesus break some things off of you so you and your family can be free to get good, so you can defeat Goliath in your life, here's what we're going to do. I want you to make your way up to the altar area at this time. I'm requesting our prayer warriors do the same. I want you to join us. And for the worship team, please return. As you're coming up here, I want to share this with you. There's a place where we learn about why we need to break off sin. And I'm going to tell you right now, if you're uncomfortable, that's not of you. That's of the enemy. If you're uncomfortable with coming up right now, that's not of you. That's of Satan. See, it says we learn where God says he will punish the children and their children for the sins of the parents to the third and fourth generation. That's Exodus 34, 7. Now, what does that mean? Well, the Bible says in other places that it would be unjust for God to hold the children guilty for the sins of their parents. Still, the sins of the fathers affect children. True. Every major Bible theme is introduced in Genesis, and the rest of the Bible explains those themes. 
So I want you to think about the Genesis story of Joseph. See, Joseph's brothers are jealous of him, and they sold him into slavery. But that sin of jealousy didn't come out of nowhere. Joseph was the son of Rachel, who was Jacob's favorite. Jacob had showed extensive favoritism to Rachel and Joseph, more so than the sons of Leah, who took it out on Joseph when they sold him into slavery. Now, Leah's sons aren't innocent, but the bitterness was from the sins of their father, from the sins of their father, okay? Put it back one more step. Jacob had a favorite son, not Isaac. It was Esau. Put it back one more step. Abraham had a favorite son. Uh, it, it was uh, Isaac, and it was not Ishmael. But when it got to Joseph, it stopped at the fourth generation when he chose to release it. And so if you are willing to release that part of you from your earthly father, Jesus will display to you an, an, an enormous amount of re, recreational love, we'll call it. Because it's yes. going to recreate you. It's going to recreate you. That's what John 3 is all about. How do I get to heaven? You don't. You need to be born again. Yes. It's like John Owen the Puritan said, you must always be killing sin or it's going to kill you. All right, so here's what we're going to do. If you need something broken off of you right now, if you need something broken off, if there's a Goliath in your life, I'm going to say a prayer over you. At the end of that prayer, I want you to breathe in and breathe out. Because God says he's a spirit in Genesis 2-7. He forms man out of the dirt of the earth and he breathes into you. Father God, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for your name, your word, your works, and your power. Lord, in the authority of the name of Jesus, I break every generational curse. I tear up legal rights known and unknown. I tear down every mantle and every altar to the root. I take all bitterness out. I tear up any generational curse. I tear up anything sworn. I tear up things that are known and unknown in the name of Jesus Christ. Not in my authority, God, but in the authority of the name of Jesus Christ. Cast it out. You need to go right now to the abyss in the name of Jesus Christ. Cast it out, cast it out in Jesus' name and fill them with your Holy Spirit, Lord. Fill them with your Holy Spirit, Lord. Fill them up, fill them up, fill them up. Fill them up with your Holy Spirit, Lord. Let's give Jesus the praise. Let's give him the worship as we begin to surrender it all. Come up for prayer. Come up for prayer. Oh, to Jesus, I surrender all.
Set a fire, Lord. Set a fire, Lord. Set a fire down in my soul that I can't contain and I can't control. I want more of you, God. I want more of you, God. So set a fire down in my soul that I can't contain and I can't control. I want more of you, God. I want more of you, God. Set a fire down in my soul that I can't contain and I can't control. I want more of you, God. I 
Here in your love, here in your love 